While World War II broke out, Sam Perry had to serve his country as a naval commander, and Dad became the head coach at USC. In 1941, he was a head coach. And then Sam came back from the service in 47. So what they did, Sam was coaching the, ba the basketball team. So that was his real thing. And baseball, he loved baseball, but he knew that Dad was much more qualified than he to run the team. But Dad knew the Sam Lincoln, so they, they set it, they put an arrangement together and they called them co-head coaches. But in reality, Dad was a head coach, but he and Sam were, they're very close friends. And then 1950, my dad took over officially as a head coach of USC baseball and started a dynasty that uh, endured for over 28 years until the 19, after the 1978 season, it was the most successful sports dynasty, in, in, obviously in college baseball, but in all sport. One of the things playing for my father, he had eyes in the back of his head. He could catch you if you were making a mental error, if you were not hustling, or if you, uh, if you made an error throwing the ball, he wouldn't, he wouldn't criticize that. He'd criticize you because you didn't move your feet. That's why he didn't throw the ball right. Errors are physical, but if he, a lot of he would associate to a mental error because you didn't move your feet to be able to throw the ball. But one of the things which he instilled, and, and it was more pressure than even some of the games, was us taking infield. Uh, he wanted a perfect infield. He insisted on that. And it was something that the, the players took pride in, and we practiced taking infield to the point where people would come out to the stadium early just to watch us take infield. Now, you know, part of the genius in that is the opposing team's watching it too. And we're taking a perfect infield. That's pretty intimidating. But also, by the time you got to the game, you're almost pressure was off. You'd had a perfect infield. Uh, he, he coached with levity um, to relax the players. He rarely ever swore. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, rarely ever raised his voice, which today's coaching is, you know, it's, it's along the lines of a John Wooden type, obviously. One of Dad's sayings was, you can't eat peas with a f knife at home and eat them with a fork in the restaurant. Think about that. You got to do it right all the time. He was a great psychologist. I mean, he knew how to get the best out of his players, what to do with college kids. And I think he'd, he'd done it with professional. You know, he knew how to, he, he knew how to motivate. He was different, different ways he did it, but he could just give you a look and you knew you'd, you knew you'd made a mistake, but he wouldn't have to say anything. You know, tiger, roll his eyes, you know, and you know, and you'd get it. You didn't have to, he didn't have to chew you out or anything like that. My dad really, really believed in teamwork and discipline and helping each other out, being part of the team, uh, having common goals. Uh, again, working hard, keeping fit, healthy, respecting each other, uh, all the things that go into life. Uh, he worked for free at SC, it's, I mean, a dollar a year. What he got, was able to do, was get the guys nice jackets and ties because he said, you have to represent USC. Putting on the USC uniform was a thrill, and a major, major thrill, and was through every time I put it on throughout my whole career. I remember one time in the other years, Tommy Lasada, I was getting dressed. Tommy Lasada was scouting then for the Dodgers. And he says, Coach, he said, how many times do, do you think you really have put on this uniform? Because when you think of all the practice days and then the winter time and, and over that many years, it was quite a few games. But I, I was thrilled with it. I guess I was always uh, able to uh, uh, sell the idea of how important it was to our players. Maybe it helped make them proud to wear it. Uh, and I think to this day that does hold as a pride in wearing that Trojan on one's chest, even if it's not baseball, but if baseball, just more so. From 1970 to 1974, 
the USC Trojan baseball team accomplished something that is considered impossible. They won five consecutive national championships. And people have always tried to say, what was it? And I've never, I, I've always, there was a chemistry that existed. I, I was the bench coach, and I can honestly say that when we sat together, there was a, there, there was a communication between us, and it may sound crazy, but I know it's true. We knew what was going to happen before it happened. Think about that. There has to be an explanation. But it, it manifested itself in so many ways. He would call a pitch out, and they would be running. He'd do things and just seemed to know what the other team was thinking and what was going to happen. And he could tell this is an instinct. He just... It's like these managers today, they don't manage by instinct. They, they manage by statistics. It's not statistics. It's something you feel, something you can see that's going to happen. But there, was, but there was intense, at the core of it, was intense intention to detail. And all this that he'd learned, and, as he, was, and he was always learning more about the game. Every game you go to, if you're paying attention, you will see something you've never seen before. And you catalog that. And so when that, finally, I just think his powers were so great at that point and was able to communicate to the players. And like I said, you have to have, I mean, we had some terrific players in those days. I mean, you can't do that without the talent. We had some real, real talent. Well, truly, the feat to win those five national championships or six out of seven years with different lineups. I mean, it is, you know, in baseball, a lot of your best athletes may be a pitcher. Well, he's only pitching once every four days, four or five days. So he's not, he's not playing for you. Uh, and if, if you would look at the lineups, you know, we had a, a Freddie Lynn who was a superstar. But he only, you know, only played a couple of years before he signed professionally. And so a lot of those players would come and go. And, and uh, there were years that, that, you know, hey, we were stacked with what we felt was really good talent, but other years that, hey, we, we just strung it together. And, and again, a tribute to his coaching of, of players that never made it to the major leagues, that just excelled at the moment. And, and their life, that was their life, but they worked hard for it, and they were able to achieve their goals. And, and, uh, and so many of them have achieved them goals in other areas, but during those championship years, they were, they were the college world champion. The thing that meant the most to me was being with my dad in the dugout, in the chemistry between us, and just being there with him. What he loved the most was baseball itself, the game itself, the beauty of the game, the integrity of the game. He loved to teach the game. And in his later years, while he wasn't, uh, there was a period where he was not successful in the end of his coaching career as far as wins and losses, I thought it was endearing that he didn't want to retire. He, he loved the game. He just loved being in uniform. He loved being with the young, young people. Uh, he loved the, her dad well, did love attention, of course, but, and he was a legend. And, uh, but the game to him was more important than the wins and losses. And he'd still be coaching today if, if, if he was alive. He'd have, he'd have coached forever. He loved it that much. He loved the game that much.